Revelation chapter 4, if you're there, say amen. Okay, here we go, church. Interesting scripture this morning. It says, after these things, chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place. Notice the phrase again, after these things. Now, after these things, very important phrase. He begins the verse and ends the verse with after these things. After what things? What have you been studying the last two weeks? Chapters two and three. The church, the seven messages of the seven churches, which represents the church age. And what he's saying here is after the church age, we're gonna see these things take place for the remainder of the book of Revelation up until the second coming of Christ, which is the great tribulation. And so what he's talking about is after the church age, just like he's being caught up in heaven and through this door, so believers are going to be exited out of here. They're going to be caught up to heaven too, and they're going to be raptured. That's what the doctrine of the rapture is. Now, rapture, what's that all about? Well, it goes back to our timeline. They should be on your seats. The timeline with a bookmark that we're giving out to you guys is this. Here's what's going to happen. You've got the church age. And then at the end of the church age, there's what, what we call the rapture. We're going to be is we're going to be caught up in the clouds to be with Christ, and Christians are going to be taken out of this world, and then God's going to bring us seven years of great tribulation, like the world has never seen before. And we're going to be studying that as we go through the book of Revelation. It's an amazing time where God just unleashes his judgment upon the world. And then after the seven years of great tribulation, here's what happens. Christ comes back. Revelation 19 and he's going to come back on a white horse, and he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. Our prayers will be answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then after the thousand years of great tribulation, or a thousand years of the millennial rule of Christ, what happens is then there's the great white throne of judgment. Now what's going to happen is all the people that have rejected Christ, even the demons, even Satan himself, will be brought before the great white throne of judgment, and they'll be judged according to their deeds, and they'll be thrown in the lake of fire, and then God's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth. So we're on the timeline now. Rapture. After these things. After the church age. And then he gets this, he's brought up just like with the rapture to heaven, with the door being opened. And then after this rapture, it's going to be the great tribulation. Now, question, why do I believe in the rapture? I'll give you three reasons I believe in the rapture. Number one, it's consistent with God's nature. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when God brings judgment to this world, he gets his people out of it. Think of the worldwide judgment that happened in the book of Genesis. It's a flood, right? And before he brought the worldwide judgment of the flood, what did he do with Noah? Had him build an ark and got him out of that judgment. Think on a smaller scale, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Who was living in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot and his wife, and they were righteous. And so what did God do? He got them out of Sodom and Gomorrah and sent an angel and said, get out of there, because I'm bringing judgment to this city, and I want righteous Lot and his family out of the judgment. So it's consistent with God's nature in past judgments throughout the Bible is God gets his people out of that judgment. Now, he doesn't get us out of persecution, but persecution is from the world, judgments from God. Now, also, it's not only consistent with his nature, but also the rapture is consistent with the, the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. What does that mean? That means that when Christ comes, there's going to be immediacy. There's going to be Jesus described his coming for the church and the rapture as a thief in the night. What does that mean? He's going to come unexpectedly and quickly. How does a thief come? Does he, does he set a date with you to rob your house? No, that doesn't happen that way. He comes like a thief in the night. And so when Jesus comes, no one's going to know, he said, the day or the hour. He, no one will know when he's coming. Now, if, if, if you're a post-tribber and you believe there's tribulation the whole church is going to go through and there's only the second coming of Christ, that doesn't fit with the imminent return of Christ. You know why? Because we're going to see as we go through the uh, Great Tribulation, there's a thing called the Abomination of Desolation, which the Antichrist sets up his image in the temple in Jerusalem, and then three and a half years after the Abomination of Desolation, Christ is coming. So if you're a Christian during the seven-year Great Tribulation, you get saved during that period after the rapture, you're going to know after the Abomination of Desolation, three and a half years later, Christ is coming back. 
It's not going to be like a thief in the night, so you'll know the date. But for us, as believers, the rapture is going to come like a thief in the night. Suddenly, unexpectedly, boom! Beat me up, Jesus, man. Out of here. Thief in the night. But, so it's consistent with his nature. It's consistent with the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. But it's also, the rapture is also, most importantly, consistent with Scripture. People say, well, the rapture is not found in the Bible. Well, they're right. The word rapture is not found in the Bible, but the concept in the teaching of the rapture is found in the Bible. Do you know the word trinity? Trinity is not found in the Bible. But we see the teaching of the Trinity throughout the pages of Scripture. And we see the teaching of the rapture throughout Scripture too. I'll just give you a few examples. Jesus, before he was going to be ascended to heaven, said, John 14, 1 to 3, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. We sang about that this morning. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And what does he say? I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, what? There you may be also. Now, when Christ comes and a second coming after the great tribulation, he's not coming He's not coming to bring us to heaven. He's coming with us to bring heaven to earth. But at the rapture, he's coming for the church, like he says right here, and he's coming for us to bring us to heaven. At his second coming, what's happening, he's coming with us to bring heaven to earth. See the difference? So the rapture is being talked about there. Jesus, I'm coming again for the rapture, and I'm going to bring my people to heaven with me to the place where there's many dwelling places for those seven years of judgment. Another scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 18. This is where we get the, actually the word rapture from. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ, will rise first. Then we who are alive will remain and be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're going to be caught up. The word caught up there is harpazo. It means to be snatched away quickly and even violently. Boom! Caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord where? in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're going to be caught up, snatched away. It's going to be amazing. And, 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 and we're going to see in the next scripture I'll give you, it's going to happen just boom, like this, in a twinkling of an eye, like a blinking of an eye, and boom, we're out of here. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 50 says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. The word sleep there is a euphemism for death. We're not all going to die. Some, some are going to be raptured. But we'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound. You see the trumpet again? The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperish, imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's going to happen at the rapture. Here's what's going to happen. At the rapture, when we're caught up in the clouds to be with him, we're going to be taken from these mortal bodies, and then we're going to be given immortal bodies. We're going to be taken from these perishable bodies to imperishable bodies. And the older I get, the more I say amen to that. The older I get, the more I say, oh, oh, oh Maranatha, beam me up, Jesus, quickly. Can't wait to get that immortal, imperishable body. Maybe I'll have hair again. What do you think? Wouldn't that be cool? I think we'll all personally, I believe that when we're raptured, we get our immortal, imperishable bodies, I'll be, I think we'll be at our peak for the rest of eternity. Our youngest, strongest years, well, that's where we're going to be at for the rest of eternity. And we'll be given resurrected bodies, which is kind of cool too, because Jesus in his resurrected body, it will have the same kind of resurrected body, I think it's Jesus, and we'll be able to transport ourselves, no more car problems, to boom, right there. That's how Jesus was in his resurrected body. They were behind locked doors, and Jesus just transported himself into the upper room through the locked doors. It's going to be awesome. Immortal, imperishable bodies. Now listen, church. There's people that believe differently. There's, there's people that are post-tribbers. You know what post-tribbers are? They believe that the church must go through the judgment of the great tribulation. And it's okay to, to have fellowship with people. It's not a salvation issue. It's just a doctrinal issue on whether you believe we're going to go through the tribulation or not. It's okay that they're wrong about the rapture, okay? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Don't disfellowship with people just because they're post-tribbers, okay? 
And you know what? Here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal, too. If, if all of a sudden the Antichrist comes on the scene, and all of a sudden the things in the Great Tribulation all start, start transpiring, and I'm still here, I'll change my theology. All of a sudden, I'm a post river too. But you know what? I could change my theology. If you don't believe in the rapture, what's going to happen when you get raptured? You're getting beamed up, and I'll be looking right at you and say, I told you so. See that? I remember when the, one of the last times I taught through the book of Revelation right here, there was a guy in the church, and he confronted me right when we began the book of Revelation, we started talking about the, of the rapture. He confronted me at the door in front of all the people that were coming out the door, and I was greeting and stuff, and he said, how can you believe in something that's not in the Bible? It's a conspiracy coming up with this idea of the rapture, all this other stuff, and he just blistered me on the way out, and I didn't even have a chance to say, I believe this because of this scripture, this scripture. He just walked right out the door, and then he kept coming. As I taught through the book of Revelation, I remember he sat, this was back in the other Jesus Dome, he sat right over here, and as I would start to teach, and whenever I used the word rapture and taught about it from the book of Revelation, he would stand up. He was always in the front, front rows, too. He'd stand up, and he'd do a U-turn, but it wasn't a U-turn for Christ. It was a U-turn out of church. And I'm going, God bless you. <laughs> but, you know, it shouldn't be something that should divide us in fellowship with other people. But I believe the rapture is biblical, it's consistent with God's nature, and it fits with what we believe about the immediacy and the imminent return of Christ that he's coming like a thief in the night. Does that make sense? After these things, after the church age, the rapture is going to happen. Verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was standing in heaven, verse 2, and one sitting on a throne. Interesting. The first thing John sees as he goes through the door to heaven, what's he see? The throne. And what's God doing on the throne? He's sitting. You know why he's sitting? Because he's in total control. He's sovereign. He's got it all figured out, and his plans are prevailing. And church, we need to remember that with what's going on in our country right now. God's on the throne. He, he, he was on the throne, he is on the throne, and he'll ever be, forever be on the throne. You know why? Because God's sovereign. He's got this whole thing figured out, and not only does he have it figured out, not only does he have foreknowledge of what's going to happen, but he's sovereignly the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he's on the throne and you know what? No matter what life throws at you, you need to understand, God's on the throne. God is on the throne. Amen? God is on the throne. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how bad it gets, God's on the throne. And he's causing all things to work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, Plans not for calamity. Plans for welfare, for a future and a hope. And we always need to remember the first thing we're going to see when we get to heaven is God on the throne. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in total control, even sinning, because He's got this. You know, you know what? And when the tumultuous times come, like we're in right now, with our country and the chaos and all the stuff that's happening, we need to be reminded. God is in heaven, and God is on the throne. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So let's go. Let's keep going now. He's sitting on the throne, verse 3, and he was sitting, and he was sitting, was like a jasper stone, interesting, and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance, interesting. So that now there's some precious stones at the throne, and they're, they're, they're different, different stones that radiate different things. The first stone he sees is a jasper stone. Jasper stone is similar to our diamond today. It was a clear crystal stone that, that was just brilliant when light would hit it. It's kind of like, kind of like diamonds. I remember when I bought Heidi's engagement ring. I, I, I went to this place in Los Angeles where I was living at the time. It was called the Jewelry Mart, and it had 11 stories of jewelry stores. And it was interesting because all the walls for all the stores were just glass walls. But to get into each one of these stores, you had to ring a doorbell. And they would look at you through the glass walls, and if you looked acceptable, they would open the locked door. If you looked like you were riffraff, they'd say, go away. And so I got my way into one of those stores, and I, I remember going, and, and, and I remember going in, and the first thing they did was they laid out this black velvet cloth, 
and there was like beaming lights on the black velvet cloth. And then the guy would take this black bag, velvet bag, and he'd throw the diamonds out on the black, on the black velvet, and the light would refract off these diamonds. You go, whoa, this is brilliant. And I was also thinking, this is going to be a lot of money. But it was like, wow. And so when John gets to heaven, the first thing he sees is a jasper stone. Why? Because God is light. And he dwells in inapproachable light. And God's glory is going to light up heaven through this kind of like brilliance that's going to come from this jasper stone. We're going to see it when we get to the end of the book of Revelation. It says there's no need for light or lamps in heaven because God's glory lights up all of heaven for the rest of eternity. And so there's not even night in heaven because it's glorious lit up for the rest of eternity. Another picture we get here with the precious stones is sardius. What's sardius? It's like ruby red stone. So when we get to heaven, we're not going to see the brilliance of God's glory and his light. We're going to see this redness around the throne. Why? Because we not only know God is glorious, God is redemptive. And what's the red stand for? The blood of Christ. And we're going to be reminded for the rest of eternity as we worship the lamb who was slain. And by the way, we're going to see next week in Revelation 4, Jesus in eternity is going to be like a lamb who was slain. What does that mean? It means the scars in the the torture he faced for us on the cross, we're going to see it on his hands and his feet for the rest of eternity. And we're going to be reminded of the redemptive work he did for us for the rest of eternity. And that's a part of our worship of Jesus, the lamb who was slain. And so not only is God glorious, but he's redemptive. And we're going to see that in the colors around his throne. But the last thing we see around the throne is a rainbow. What does that go back to? Noah again. Remember Noah? He was told it never rained on earth because they had this water canopy above the earth and a mist coming off the earth. There was no need for rain. And God said, no, it's going to rain. Build an ark. And, and then all of a sudden the rain came. Never had rained before on earth. And for 40 days and 40 nights, rain descended on the earth. And it covered all the land to the point that everybody that wasn't on the ark died and drowned in the judgment that God brought upon the earth. And then the dove went out and brought back a little wreath. And it said, yep, God's stopping the judgment. And then after that, there's this rainbow. And the rainbow was God saying to, to, to Noah, I will never judge the earth ever again in this way. So it's a sign of God's faithfulness. Now, rainbow in our culture today, it's been perverted. It's, it's, it stands for something else. But in, in the original rainbow that God brought was as a sign of God's faithfulness. So we need to remember God is glorious. He's a, God is light. God is redemptive. But God is also faithful. Paul said to Timothy, even when we're faithless, God is faithful because he cannot deny himself. What's he faithful to? He's faithful to all the promises he gives us throughout this book. He's faithful. He's not only faithful, but he says, my promises are yes and amen. Amen, it means so be it. I heard about this Chinese uh, young man who just became a Christian. And after he became a Christian in China, he decided, I'm going to get a Bible. And he got his own Bible. And he decided, I'm going to read through the entire New Testament as a young Christian. And he started reading through the, started in the New Testament with the Gospel of Matthew. He got to the last verse of the Gospel of Matthew. And his name, by the way, was Lo. He gets to the last verse. And he reads the last verse and he goes, and Jesus says, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He goes, Scripture's talking to me. That's it. My name's Lo. And he goes, that's me. And he promises me that he'll be with me always, even in the age. And I was thinking about that. I'm going, hey, we could put our names in all the promises of God, too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if John Hoppy believes in him, John Hoppy will not perish, but John Hoppy has eternal life. Huh. If God be for John Hoppy, who could be against him? I like that one. John Hoppy, you're more than a conqueror through Christ who loves John Hoppy. John Hoppy, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. John Hoppy, greater is he that is in John Hoppy than he that's in the world. You could put your name there too if you're a believer. 
God's faithfulness. Amen? And when we get to heaven, we're going to be reminded of God's faithfulness. And I tell, by the way, Noah really needed that too. Because you know what? Can you imagine being Noah after it never rained again and all of a sudden uh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights? Judgment, all these people die. Can you imagine the next time it rained on earth? And Noah's going, whoa, what's it? God's doing it again. No, no, rainbow. God's faithful. He'll never do it again. And so we could bank on the promises of God. And we're going to be reminded for the rest of eternity in heaven of God's faithfulness by the rainbow around his throne. And then it says this, in the, around the throne were 24 thrones, interesting, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Now that's interesting too because we see it's not just God's throne in heaven, there's 24 other thrones. And what are those thrones for? They're for elders. Elders in the New Testament were leaders. And so what this tells us in heaven is God has established leadership in heaven and there's going to be 24 other elders in heaven leading the kingdom of God for the rest of eternity. Now question, who are these leaders? Well, I don't know. But I know who 12 of them are. 12 of them are the apostles. And I know that because we're told in the Gospels, we're told about in Matthew... Um, Jesus speaking to Peter, Peter says to him, behold, we've left everything, Jesus, to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, to the apostles, truly I say to you that you, should, you have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So these apostles, all of them except for John, died preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were martyred, and they're going to be leading heaven with Jesus on 12 of the 24 thrones. Now, who are the other 12? Well, I don't know. But I feel that possibly they could be the patriarchs from the Old Testament. Guys like Joseph, David, Moses, Abraham. But there's going to be 12 leaders in heaven. Interesting, too. Those leaders not only have leadership with with Jesus for the rest of eternity, but they have crowns. What's up with that? They're all just kind of walking around with crowns. Hey, look at my crown. I got more jewels on there. No, no, that's not the purpose. The, the crowns are always symbolic in the New Testament of rewards. There's all kinds of rewards talked about in the New Testament, and they're oftentimes talked about as crowns. You know what that tells us? We're not saved. We don't go to heaven based on our works. We're saved by what? Grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. We're, none of us when we get to heaven are going to say, I'm here because I did something. No, we're here because of what Jesus did on the cross. But, listen church, we're not saved by what we do for Christ here on earth, but we're rewarded in heaven for the rest of eternity for what we do. And we know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, as we have the precious stones of doing eternal things for God, there's going to be a revealing fire burning away all the wood, hay, and stubble, and the things that are going to remain for the rest of eternity, we will be rewarded for, for what we do here on earth. And as we use our time, as we use our talents, as we use our treasures for the kingdom of God and for eternal things, here's what's going to happen. We will be rewarded for the rest of eternity in different areas. And listen, one of the rewards, I think, of heaven is going to be leadership for those that serve Christ here on earth. Because he who has been faithful with little will be entrusted with more. Amen? And that's what we're seeing here in heaven is these elders are leaders. And they're going to be leaders for the rest of eternity because they were so faithful in serving Christ here on earth. They're going to be given crowns. So they're given rewards of leadership. And then it says in verse 5, And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We saw last week seven spirits of God, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, because seven is a number of completion, right? Also, it's a number that the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 11, 2, talks about the seven different natures of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, but interesting, around the throne of God, too, there's, there's not only the seven spirits, there's flashes of lightning and thunder. A question, church. What happens before a storm? 
I remember one of the most interesting weddings. I've probably done about 100 weddings in the last 34 years of ministry. But one of the most interesting ones I ever did was I was in Wisconsin pastoring at the time. And this young couple asked me to marry them on the lake. And so we, we had this whole thing set up side, outside on the grass. They had this altar where they were at on the grass and everything else. And I was looking out on the lake on the grass as I was doing the wedding for them. And they had all the white chairs all pointed towards, towards the bride and the groom. But I was looking at the lake. Because on the lake, there was a storm coming. Lake Winnicani. And I saw all of a sudden, as I'm doing, as I'm doing fishing in the wedding, all of a sudden I see these lightning bolts hitting the water. And then boom, boom, like this. And I did the fastest wedding I've ever done in my whole life. <laughs> Some people thought I might have been speaking in tongues because I get this thing done like this. And we got this thing done. We got her done. We got her done quick. And as soon as I got these nuptial kiss done, we all ran into a building and the thunder and lightning turned into this storm so bad. You could see the, the trees bending in the wind with this storm. And we got the bride and groom out of that into the building that was on the property. But it was a storm. So what's this telling us? The throne of God before the great tribulation. It's going to be lightning and thunder because it's preceding the storm. And what storm is that? The great tribulation, the judgment of God upon the world's coming. And there's thunder and lightning to, to signify that. And then it says in verse 6, And before the throne, there, there were, were as a, a sea of glass like crystal. And this, in the center around the throne, there's four living creatures full of eyes in front and, be, and behind. Now before we talk about the four living creatures, notice also around the throne, there's a sea of glass like crystal. Now why is there this sea of glass around the throne room in heaven? I did not live on this little cove all the way out in Leesville, and um, one of the things we have in our second story is we have this reading room. It's my favorite room in the house. We start our day, we end our day in the reading room. And the reading room looks out on the cove, and, uh, uh, and when the sun comes up in the morning, if we're up early enough reading our Bible, we see the, it's amazing, we, we'll, we'll see the sun glistening on the cove, and the water's like a sea of glass. And as I look out on that water, especially as the sun is coming up, it is just so peaceful. And what this is saying is a part of heaven, it's going to be like a sea of glass, peace, peace like a river. It, and we're going to be saying when we, for the rest of eternity, it is well with my soul. The restlessness will be gone. It's going to be amazing. The peace that's going to emanate from the Prince of Peace for the rest of eternity, will take away all the stress, all the anxiety, all the restlessness we have in this world. Gone! And there'll be peace. It's going to be wonderful. Can't wait. And I tell you what, sometimes when we, when we are having stress and anxiety and restlessness in our life, the best thing we could do is go to God's throne room. Because he who keeps his mind on thee keeps it in perfect peace. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Get in his presence. Get your heart in heaven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But when we get to heaven, stress gone. Anxiety gone. Restlessness gone. Looking forward to it. Now let's look at these four creatures that are around the throne. There's four living creatures, full of eyes, in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion... The second creature, verse 7, was like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Now what's up with this? Kind of reminds me of a scary movie. You've got these, these creatures around God's throne. There's eyes all over them and stuff. And they've got these different animal things on their faces. What is up with this? Well, most scholars believe, and it goes all the way back to the founding fathers of of Christianity, they believe that these angels are symbolic of the four Gospels of Jesus Christ. The first Gospel is Matthew. And Matthew is displayed throughout the whole book of Matthew as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And this first angel is probably symbolic of Matthew and the portrait of Jesus in Matthew. The second Gospel is Mark. In Mark, Jesus is portrayed as the one who didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He was a servant. The calf 
which would become an ox, was a working animal, was a serving animal. The third gospel is Luke. In Luke, Jesus is represented as the son of man. He's displayed as this angel as man. He's talked about as the son of man all throughout the gospel of Luke, that he's, yes, fully God, but he's fully man. And then in John, Jesus is talked about from the very beginning of John. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was what? God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was like an eagle coming from heaven to earth. So these angels could be symbolic of the four natures of who Jesus is throughout the Gospels uh, in the first four books of the Bible. But notice what these angels are declaring. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So we see worship now in heaven. And it's interesting, the worship is, first of all, declaring who God is. And who's God? Holy. It doesn't say it once. The angels declare it three times. Holy, holy, holy. And we need to remember that. Our God is holy. Yeah, God is love. John's going to tell us that in 1 John, that God is love. But God also is holy. We've lost that some of that in our culture today. We just think of God as, we hear people say, oh, he's just my, the good old boy in the sky. And there's a lack of reverence. There's a lack of, of remembering the holiness of God. Now, it could be saying holy, holy, holy also, these angels, because it might be declaring the Trinity. God is holy, the Father's holy, Jesus is holy, and the Holy Spirit's holy. But notice also their worship is not only declaring who God is. He is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, but he's the Almighty. What does that mean? The Omnipotent One. The one who's got all the power in all creation. And he's talking about the eternal one too. The one who is and who is yet to come. Interesting. The power of God, the eternal nature of God, and not only that, who he is. Holy, holy, holy. And then when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. And I want you to see something before you just glance over this. I want you to see something here. They're doing this, verse 8, and then in verse 9, they're giving them this glory and thanksgiving and honor, and they're doing it without ceasing. We're going to see next week, we're actually going to see that myriads, which is 10,000 multiplied by 10,000 angels, are unceasingly saying around the throne of God, holy is the Lamb who is slain for our sins, and they're going to be doing for that for the rest of eternity without stopping. Now, 10,000 multiplied by 10,000, what is that? Math students, 100 million. It's going to be amazing. And these angels and these elders and these Christians around the throne of God for the rest of eternity are going to be saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Interesting. They're also going to be giving glory. You know what worship is for? Listen, church, worship is not for you. Worship is for giving God glory. You know, sometimes, oh, I don't like that song so much. The worship team wasn't on today. I wasn't blessed enough in worship. Hey, it's not about you anyways. It's about Jesus and giving him glory. And it's also about honor. What does that mean? When we're worshiping in spirit and truth, we're giving God honor. We're giving him the value that he's worthy of. And not only honor, but also the elders and the angels and the people around the throne are giving God thanks That's what we do with worship too, by the way. Remember all that God's blessed us with. We enter his courts with thanksgiving, or his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. And what we're doing in our worship is we're going, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for redeeming me by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, God, that you sent your son Jesus for me. Thank you, God, that because of your salvation, redemption in my life, I'm going to heaven instead of hell. We're giving him glory and honor, and we're giving him thanks through our worship. And one of the things that makes heaven heaven is the unceasing worship that will be happening for the rest of eternity. It's going to be awesome. You think we got good worship here at Calvary Chapel? Wait till you get to heaven, man. It is going to blow your mind. It will bless you beyond belief for the rest of eternity. When I was just a young pastor in Southern California pastoring, Uh, I took a bunch of our people to the very first Harvest Crusade by Greg Laurie. We didn't know how how many people were going to come, but Pastor Chuck rented the whole Pacific Amphitheater, and I'll never forget 
getting there. There was over 20,000 people outside in this Pacific amphitheater, and it was a beautiful San Diego type kind of Orange County type of Southern California night. I remember getting there, and the Maranatha Praise Band, which was an awesome worship band at the time, led all 20,000 of us in worship, and I felt like I was in heaven on earth. And then Greg Laurie comes out and gives this great evangelistic message. And it was amazing because what happened was, I'll never forget it. They, they didn't know what that would happen with just doing worship and evangelism. But he gave the gospel and 2,000 people came up at the altar call to get saved. And the Maranatha worship band was out there and, and, and they were leading us in worship as all these people were coming to the altar to, to get saved. And then it was so glorious and such a beautiful time. It was like heaven here on earth to the point that the Maranatha band just kept leading us in worship. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we're still giving praise to God. And I'll never forget, Pastor Chuck finally came out. He came out and he's, he, after 20 minutes of worship, he went to the pulpit and said, hey, 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 Christians, you need to understand, it's only not going to stop when you get to heaven. We've paid for this facility until 1030 and it's 1015. You need to go home. But I, I'll, I'll never forget that because it was like heaven here on earth. Why do we sing so many worship songs here at Calvary Chapel? Why do we make it such a big deal about worship here at Calvary Chapel? Because it's heaven here on earth when we come into his presence and give him glory and honor and thanksgiving. The Bible says God's spirit inhabits the praises of his people. And as we get it right and we become worshipers of God, heaven inhabits those praises, and we have the glory of God changing us from glory to glory into his image. It's awesome. Another event I'll remember that was like heaven here on earth. We took a bunch of our men to stand in the gap. I'll never forget it. We get up to Washington, D.C., and there was a million men on the mall, and there was multiple stages across the mall, and a million men worshiping all day long on a Saturday, and I was just glorious. We had this black church, African-American church, that had come in from Chicago, and they were all sitting behind us, and it was amped up. The power of God was there. And for a million men worshiping God, and I'll never forget, by the end of that day of worshiping all day long, we had to get on the subway to go back to Virginia where our hotel was at, and as hundreds of men were getting on the subway to go back to Virginia, there was just choruses of praise, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. We sang choruses all the way onto the train, all the way on the subway, all the way back to Virginia, and I was thinking, that's heaven, heaven here on earth. And that's what we got to look forward to. And you think, again, the worship is great here, and it is great here sometimes, but it'll be a hundred times more magnificent when we get to heaven and the king is on his throne and our sin nature is eradicated. And we're given, our, eventually, our immortal, imperishable bodies. And we get the glory of that for the rest of eternity. That's what's going to make heaven, heaven. Now let's close it up. And it says, when the living creatures, verse 9, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And notice this, they'll cast their crowns before the throne. Why are they doing that? They worked their whole lives for these crowns. And they're going to take their crowns and at the king of kings throne, they're going to cast them down to the throne. Well, part of it is when we get to heaven, we don't want any of the glory. Part of it is we just want to give humbly all the glory back to the one that saved us. But a part of it is, too, it's a sign of surrender. In that culture, the Roman Empire of that culture, they were taking over the whole world. And when a Roman emperor would take over a new country that was just conquered, there was a process, there was a protocol. And the king of the country that was conquered, as long as there was Roman peace now with that new, new country, that king of the other country that was conquered would come to the Roman palace and he'd make peace with the emperor. And he would take his crown and he would put it at the feet of the Roman emperor. Why? Why? Because he said, surrender. We are surrendered now to your leadership and to your crown. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be in a place of not only gratitude, of giving God glory and honor and thanksgiving for all he's done for us, but we're also going to be surrendered to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's a part of worship too, by the way. When we come here on Sunday mornings and we're lifting our hands, what is that a sign of? Surrender. 
What are you going to do if you're in an alley in an inner city and someone pulls a gun on you and says, you know, what are you going to do? I, I don't know about you, I, especially if I don't have a gun. I'm going to go, oh, got me, surrendered. And when we worship with hands lifted up, we're just saying, God, my crowns are thrown at your feet. I'm surrendered to your lordship and your rule in my life. And then the last thing, we'll close with this, it says this, and worthy, they'll be saying, art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou didst create all things, and because of thy will, they existed and were created. Why is God worthy of our worship? Why? Well, because of his glory and honor and power, but also because he's the creator of all things. And the creatures are us, and we're supposed to worship the one who created us. And not only that, this was his will. It actually says in Revelation 4.11 in the King James Version, it says, for thy good pleasure we were and we are created. And here's the deal. What happens as we get this thing right and we live as worshipers of the one who created us, what happens is we fulfill the will for which we were created and we even give God pleasure in our worship. That's awesome. One of the ways we could bless God, one of the ways we could please God, one of the ways we could bring him pleasure is through our worship. Interesting, I did some word study on the word worship. In the Greek, it's proskuneo. You know what it means? It means to bow down and kiss. And what we're doing in our worship, again, we're surrendering, we're bowing down to the King of kings and Lord of lords, but we're also showing affection and love to the one that's loved us. And we love because he first loved us. And that blesses God. That gives him pleasure. Interesting. I looked up the word, I did a word study on the word uh, proskunia. Not, not only means bend down and kiss, worship, but it also literally could be translated a dog licking his master's face. Isn't that cool? I don't know about you, but I love dogs. I've always loved dogs and I've always loved dogs. I've had a dog since I've been this high and I love dogs. You know why I love dogs? Because they love me. I remember when my kids, <laughs> I remember when my kids became, you know, preschoolers, I'd come home at the end of the day or something, and I'd walk in the door, and these kids would be at the door, and they'd be jumping, and, Daddy's home! And then they became teenagers, and they could care less whether I'm home or not. <laughs> but even to this day, when I come home, my dog now, Jojo, when I come home, that dog's at the front door wagging its tail, and as soon as I get in that door, he's attacking me with love and affection. And we even have this thing that Jojo will sit on the steps like this in our, in our house. And there's like these little spindles. And I call it Jojo's in jail again because I walk past those spindles. And as I walk past, he'll, he'll, his tail will start wagging and stuff like that. And then I'll get close and I'll put my head like this. And he pros Cornelius. He bows down and he licks my bald head. And he's just, oh, look at this. I'm going, I love my dog. Proskuneo, Jojo. I'm your master. Lick my bald head again. And he does. It's awesome. And I love my dog. Now, cats, I could get, forget cats. But if you're a cat lover, God bless you. But cats don't listen to me. They don't lick my bald head. All they do is just do their own thing. But, but my dog, my, <laughs> I'm never going to get some hate mail on this. But my dog, my dog, my dog loves me. And I love my dog because my dog loves me. See the analogy? When we worship in spirit and truth, we give glory and honor and praise and love to our creator, our master. It brings them pleasure. And listen, church, it's what you're created for. You will never have peace. You'll never have true joy. You'll never have just a sign, a, a, a feeling of this is, I'm fulfilling my destiny until you become a worshiper of the one who created you. There's a hole in your heart for a reason, and that's to find your meaning and purpose and joy in worshiping the one you were created for. And what happens too, this is really cool, when life is hard and trials come and pain is there, and people die that you're gonna, you love so much, they're gone. Or you have health problems, you have pain, you have issues, you have stress, you have things at work. When things like that happen, 
Don't stop worshiping God. Because as you get back into his presence and worship him, what happens is you get your eyes off the circumstances and you get them onto the greatness of your God and those circumstances become less in the presence of the one who's so great and glorious and deserves our honor and praise. And it'll, it'll recalibrate and it'll give you peace instead of anxiety and stress as you worship God. Ask Paul and Silas. Remember in Philippi, they're thrown into this dungeon and they're beaten with rods on their back and they're put in stocks and it was about midnight and what'd they do? They sang hymns of praise to their God. And in the midst of that, all of a sudden, God delivered them and set them free through an earthquake. And listen, God will deliver you too. In your worship and praise, he'll deliver you from stress and give you a, a magnificence of his presence and his glory and his help. Amen? Let's be proskuneo Christians. Let's be worshipers of the God who's so worthy of our worship. Let's always be people that are throwing our crowns at his feet, surrendered to him, and it all being about the glory of God. We were created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let's be those kind of Christians. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you, God, that your word reminds us of who we are. We are just creatures created by you, God, to give you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving, God. Forgive us when we're, our world revolves around us rather than Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our narcissistic nature of it just being about us rather than about the glory of God. Help us to recalibrate, even this morning, that, God, that says, God, I just want to be a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to you, which is our spiritual service of worship. Help us to be people that once again realize the magnificence and the greatness and the power, the almighty power of the one that we have relationship with. Thank you, God, that as we come into your presence, God, you're worthy of our worship. Father, help us to be people, too, that when, we're the, when there's stress, when there's things going on that are just tough, trials, whatever, help us to remember, God, that you're on the throne. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You got this. You're sitting. You got this all under your control. And help us to remember, God, that no matter what life throws at us, God, that you're causing even all things to work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to your purposes. Father, I pray for some people that might be here this morning that are amidst the chaos. I don't know what it would be, but it might be health issues, it might be pain, it might be family struggles, it might be stuff at work, it might just, whatever. Father, help all of us to remember you're on the throne. You got it, Lord. You're sovereign. You're causing, again, all things to work together for good. You got a future and a hope for all of us. And God, help us to remember, as we started this morning, that Christ in us, it's the hope of glory. Right around the corner, we're gonna be in this place where there's gonna be no more sin, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, a place where you're gonna wipe away every tear from our eyes and we're gonna be in a place you call, God, paradise. Soon and very soon, we're gonna see our King. Christ in us is the hope of glory. We thank you, Father, for the fact the best as Christians, the best is yet to come. Help us to share this fact and these truths with people that need need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us not, not to be selfish with our gift of eternal life. Help us to be passing, even this week, eternal life <clears throat> onto those around us. Help us to be shining our lights in such a way that others may see our good works and they too may glorify our Father in heaven. Thank you so much, God, for this trip to heaven. Looking forward to next week as we have heaven part two and we see the Lamb. We see the myriads and myriads of angels around the throne of God giving the Lamb the glory, the one who's taken away our sins. Lord, help us to be citizens of heaven that remember this isn't our home. The best is yet to come. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, church.